Thank you, Stephen. That was so nice. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who's come tonight. I really appreciate you being here. Um, more thanks to my son for doing the great graphics that um, for my presentation. Um, he was working with a really difficult client, so I'm particularly <laughs> grateful for it, to him. Um, and to my daughter, who's Neve, who is in my research, um, and also to Sue, who read some of um, the drafts of my lecture. So I'm really grateful for that too. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about women and children moving precariously through urban space. But it's also a story of my own research, and it's about how I got here, how I got from where I began um, to, to my current project on gender-based violence. So I'm going to start at the very beginning. I'm, I'm not going to bore you with my whole life story, but I'm going to start with um, think, thinking about what's driven my research, both outside academia and within academia. So my childhood was in Belfast. Um, and moving around the city in the 1970s and 80s brought a sense of insecurity, of unbelonging, which was just part of everyday life. It was normal, and so we were kind of constantly told from within it. And that's what I mean by precarity. It's about a sense of insecurity that's associated with feeling out of place. Often it's taken for granted. I became more and more aware of the broader, of the difference between living in Belfast and moving in Belfast and moving in other cities, I became more aware of the broader geopolitics that created the precarities of moving around Belfast, especially when I moved away to university in England and looked back. I moved then in my imagination with my family who were still there, with my mum who travelled to work in the city centre which was surrounded by its ring of steel, with my dad who became a taxi driver just at the time when taxi drivers became the particular target of sectarian shootings. This was the imagined immobilities of moving with others and their precarities. Immobility is not just about no movement or stopping all movement, but about the restrictions of movement or forced movement, whether that's felt or experienced. Like the linkages between the felt mobilities of moving through Belfast segregated streets, the imaginings of others' movements and the broader geopolitics of colonialism that created Belfast's divides, Immobilities relates to the micro-mobilities of the body and the ways in which we sense space and think about moving through space to then the macro-mobilities of the global. Oops. Most of what I research and write about rests on this connection between these micro-mobilities and in private spaces like the home and in public spaces like city streets and their wider context, the, the, the macro-scale the macro level um, within which they're all situated. There is often some association to my own lived experience, either directly or indirectly, as, as it is with most qualitative social researchers. For example, this connecting of scales of movement is central to a paper I wrote with Nikki Khan on sometimes migrating for abortion from Ireland to Great Britain. I went to a convent school. I was aware of the complexities of seeking abortion as a Catholic teenager in Ireland, of the involvement of the, of the authorities in this very personal decision. In our paper on moving for abortion, we use the concept of immobility and personal accounts of traveling from Ireland to England, Scotland, and Wales to investigate the connections between the micro, macro scale forces of imperialism, colonialism, faith, and ideology, and the local movements, the micro mobilities of women and children and objects in seeking the care that was not available in their own country. This is what I mean by being precarious, neither being safe or feeling secure. My interest in researching women's and children's transport goes back to the mid-1990s when I joined the London Research Centre. This was an organisation funded by the London boroughs to carry out research on a range of urban issues. It had taken over the research um, department of the GLC. I worked in the transport department and was immediately drawn to their research on women in travel. Led by the director of the transport and planning group, Kerry Hamilton, who with others had pioneered work on women in travel in the 1980s, the research set out a strong case for transport policy to reflect the particular travel patterns and needs of women. When London elected its first mayor, Ken Livingstone, in 1999, 
The centre was incorporated into the Greater London Authority. I was moved to the Mayor's Transport Strategy Group and work, worked with some really great people who had taken on board much of the kind of critical academic work on transport, particularly on, on, on critiquing um, car-centred car -centered thinking. We managed to include some really innovative proposals. We were planning one of the first urban congestion charging schemes in the world, but we also wanted to include smaller scale plans that were people-centred rather than system-centred, looking at the mobility needs of different groups, and that includes women and children. We were seeking to address imbalances in the transport system, and the urban policy context at the time made that to a large extent possible. The strategy brought about significant change in London and actually to transport policy in cities all over the world. But politics got in the way. There was a concern that the flagship congestion charging scheme might be jeopardised if we didn't retain a real kind of central focus on it and, and a focus on the system rather than people. And it was decided that our team should be replaced by a major consultancy to guide the final writing of the strategy, which was obviously quite disappointing at the time. I did get some words into the strategy, which I'm really proud of, but once the strategy was launched and the team was broken up, I was moved to Transport for London. Luckily, I landed in the policy and strategy team and got the chance to work on women, travel, um, on women and children's travel issues again. And this was where I started to think about representations and cultures of travel, um, inspired by a filmmaker called Marie Lonclo, who had approached TfL to sponsor her um, master's work, a film that she was um, making for her master's at the RCA. Um, and so I worked alongside her. We, um, her. Her own film highlighted the specific barriers to travel for women moving around London at the time. Um, and then we worked together on a project um, where we um, worked with children and filmed them moving around London and the kind of barriers that they faced. Um, it was my introduction to the effectiveness of, of visual methods and engaging people, especially people who might normally, not normally take part in research. It provides the opportunity to pause and rewind, to look at the detail and highlight the mundane. I worked in more conventional projects there too, such as one with the NSPCC on the role of TfL staff in safeguarding children after a number of incidents of children being placed at risk when left stranded after they weren't allowed to get on a bus if they didn't have the fare. I experienced the impact of small-scale research and form policies in creating change. Introducing free travel for children, for example, has made travel in London less precarious. But policies like this are often linked to other agendas. The pressing demands of the climate agenda and the need for reductions in carbon emissions, for example, Often the opportunity to look across sometimes conflicting agendas is missed. My field of study is mobilities. Um, it's a large international and interdisciplinary field of study um, and transdisciplinary. It goes beyond transport and travel to the interdependent movements of people with things, with ideas, finance, communications, and importantly, the meanings behind these movements and also how mobilities are imagined. It brings together researchers from a wide range of disciplines. There's been a lot, there had been a lot written on transport exclusion, um, including by our own, by our ex PVC for um, Research and Knowledge Exchange, Andrew Church. And actually it was um, one of the mayor's transport strategy team that <coughs> suggested that I come to the University of Brighton and do a PhD with Andrew Church because of the, the work that he had done on transport exclusion. Um, my re remit when I was contributing to the Mayor's Transport Strategy had been transport inclusion and I wanted to really continue that by, um, in my work when I started my PhD here at the University. <coughs> I, like others in the field, use the term immobilities as opposed to mobilities to recognise the disconnect the blockages, the stickiness of movement, as well as controlled movement, forced movement, waiting for movement, and also resistance. It is doing what we, we started to do in the London Mayor's um, Transport Strategy, thinking about the system, thinking beyond the system to the disconnections as well as the connections. <coughs> 
There are many aspects of immobilities, and of course I can't cover all of them this evening, so I'm going to talk about immobilities as, as precarious movement, as insecure and also as violent, so I'm going to talk a bit, bit later about the, the project that Stephen mentioned on gender-based violence. Um, and this, as I was saying, is, is based on urban space producing unbelonging, producing out-of-placeness which can be related to disability, to race, sexuality, religion, but here my focus is on gender and generation. It is mostly from a UK perspective, um, that's where most of my research is situated, um, but in line with looking outwards, with making these connections between the micro and the macro, um, it links to other scales of movement. Um, I'm also interest, interested in comparative research, um, and especially transnational comparative research, um, and on the decolonising of research. So a lot of my work is with international collaborators. And um, for example, I'm going to talk a bit later about my m recent work with colleagues in Mexico. The challenge that underpins this lecture is that women and children cannot still move around our cities without precarity, without feeling in place. And this has become normalised. I use women and children here rather than gender and generation as I'm referring to empirical research and to the story of my research which started with policy. Um, when I use the term women and children I do so critically. A more theoretical approach uses the term gender immobilities, particularly as precarity that is produced through gendered power is not only experienced by women, uh, which of course includes trans women as a group who experience particular precarity when moving in in specific and actually through, throughout urban space. And recognising too that gender is non-binary. The term children is also used here critically. In empirical research, it applies to people aged from zero to 18, um, but taking a generational approach, the understanding is that childhood is not set. Indeed, it's always with us. Our childhoods are always with us. Um, and so like all generational phases, we, we don't leave it behind. So using the term generation helps us to situate childhood in relation to other generations and other generational phases. Using gender and generation, we can look through a feminist lens. For example, considering the impact of gender and generational roles and societal norms in placing women and children, often making them motionless so that moving is then considered risky. Women and children are bound together in this, connected in this immobilising which is rooted in cultures of misogyny within a patriarchal system. Recent work on mobility justice has set immobilities in the context of these broader global geopolitics of colonialism, imperialism and enslavement. So we have everyday rooted practices that become normalised. They become set within these broader landscapes of power. Although there's a, lo a large body of work on gender mobilities dating back to the 1970s, there continues to be the absence of gender awareness. For example, the transport and mobility sector is still dominated by white, able-bodied, heterosexual, middle-class men, especially in senior roles. But overall, in the UK, women make up only 26% of total transport sector workers. They make up 6% of train drivers, 12% of bus drivers, 5% of airline pilots, and only 3% of licensed taxi drivers. In order to feel safe and secure and in place, women and children need to see women behind the wheel, on the platform, on the street, not to mention making the wheels, the platforms and the streets. It was only in September, surprisingly, um, in September 2023 last year, that we had the first crash test dummy that was based on the female body, um, which is undergoing testing at the moment by the Swedish National Road and Transport Research Institute. And not surprisingly, women are more likely to get injured in head-on head -on collisions because of the way um, cars have been tested in the past, and still are, in fact. I'm focusing on these inequalities as difference in urban space. <clears throat> there are some urban scholars who might argue against this. For example, Dick Etch, drawing from a key urban, socio from a key urban sociologist, Henri Lefebvre, who developed a theory of space as being socially produced, argues against focusing on difference, as it, he argues it introduces the politics of identity, which then leads to us becoming trapped in particular social categories. 
But as others have argued, including feminist scholar Iris Marion, Iris Marion Young, if we think about the ways in which difference is felt and how it intersects through, for example, race, ethnicity, class, disability and sexuality, we can understand ways to resist and to transform not only urban space, but in turn difference. The mobile space of the city marks out difference. It creates it through uneven experiences and these embedded cultures. <coughs> moving precariously <coughs> is here about moving through urban space <coughs> in a way that is at odds with the just city. A city to which everyone has the right, including to move around. This idea has been grappled with by geographers and urban sociologists for decades. In my research, I draw from feminist scholars like Iris Marion Young, in, who put difference very much at the centre of urban injustice. I approach research through multiple lens and with friends and colleagues, with a social, cultural and spatial imagination. This is a great benefit of not being really securely fixed to one particular discipline. I'm a transdisciplinary researcher. This means not only moving across and between disciplines, but moving beyond the confines of disciplines to create new knowledge and new ways of doing research at the disciplinary scenes. Such an approach, which I share with many others, including colleagues and friends that I've worked with and are here this evening, and others from other countries, is based on an understanding that the kinds of challenges and injustices we face in the world cannot be addressed by any one discipline alone. I also approach research with the understanding that these rooted cultures cannot be changed without making evidence available in different ways, appealing to multiple senses and acknowledging emotion. Thus, I've been inspired by many. I collaborate with architects, with geographers, engineers, psychologists, criminologists, creative writers, and of course, sociologists. Sometimes there are tensions and it's really important that we acknowledge this and find a way through Working across disciplines definitely has its challenges, but I think that it's necessary um, in order to address our major contemporary global issues, which are co constantly evolving. My transdisciplinary research is focused on mobility cultures and the ways in which mobilities are represented and how they might be transformed. I've worked at the seam of, of social science and humanities in looking at mobilities in literature and film mostly urban mobilities and how they're produced through cultural products. I have, have explored cultures of children's ag agentic and imaginative mobilities, for example, through the 1930s German novel, Emily and the Detectives, and its various film adaptations, as well as their present day audiencing. <clears throat> they show how children are situated in the city in time, out of place and in the city streets and the ways in which children are a challenge to the city through their mobilities. I've written with psychogeographer Sonia Overall on impossible mobilities in children's literatures of the impossibilities of children moving in an adultist world. <clears throat> I've written with a novelist Hannah Vincent on women moving dangerously in London novels, the ways in which the city and representations of it make gendered mobilities and the ways in which gender makes the city through stories. Exploring these through a sociological lens produces insights into cultures of mobilities and the ways in which women and children are placed in urban space so that their mobilities become precarious and at the same time the ways in which both women and children resist this. I've also carried out ethnographic research on street spaces, a 24-hour ethnography with Sue Robertson, which I'm sure she remembers very well, of New Road in Brighton. Um, which is uh, a shared space which is um, designed specifically to break down those hierarchies between different uses, between the cars and people, pedestrians on the street and cyclists. We made sense of this, um, of the generational uses of the street using Lefebvre's rhythm analysis to show the contrasting diurnal rhythms. The streets continue to be a place of social interaction for women and children in the daytime, but as you, as you can, I'm sure, imagine, not so much at night. The road is not available to everyone all of the time. In a response to a paper by Cresswell on mobilities resistant in Kerouac's On the Road, Linda McDowell, the geographer, argued that the hostile response to the film Thelma and Louise was a result of the social and cultural understanding that women's place was not considered to be on the road. 
She argues that less attention has been paid to the possibilities of resistance by women who remained at home, asserting that women can resist without being mobile. And this is where it becomes more important or really important to focus on those cultures of mobilities. The idea that the home is without mobility can be disrupted if we look at the, the home in relation to other spaces. The geographer Doreen Massey argued for the need to resist the universalization of a way of imagining space. <clears throat> and thinking about space as mobile allows us to do this. this. These universal imaginings are what leads to an association of particular roles with particular places, caring for others in the home, for example. Being mobile is not only about being on the road, but also off it. In domestic spaces, but also at the very micro scale at the, of the body, for example, in examining the reactions to, of the body to threat, the paralysis of what's called tonic immobility, which is the body's defence response to extreme stress and is often overlooked in accounts of sexual assault. The association of the road with moving and off the, and off the road as not moving, alongside the universalising universalizing of everyday practices, creates cultures of mobilities that are gendered. Again, women and children get placed and being out of place is precarious, is then precarious. Thinking of space as mobile allows us to think about the lived experience of this emplacement and how spaces are connected so that movement between them then helps illuminate the, universe, the universal ways of imagining them. So, for example, connecting the lived experience of domestic violence that is imagined in the home to harassment that's imagined in the street or in public transport. Cultures of, accept, of accepted mobilities that underpin precarious movement and gender violence often begin with the body. As many feminist scholars have argued, the body can be the root of their subordination. The female body, as observed across history, has been located in these particular private spaces as part of the patriarchal alienation of women from public space. But as well as resist this, it's necessary to include these spaces as being part of the urban. Much of the discussion of rights to the city and urban justice fails to do this. In order to understand how the non-male body is culturally marked, we need to look at the totality of urban space, including inside houses, workplaces, schools, train stations, and also in online spaces, to see where women and children are in place or out of place, and when moving within, through, and between these spaces becomes precarious. Space and spatial cultures make the gendered body through process of, processes of embodiment, through dominant discourses, which are sets of common understandings that are so entrenched that they're taking as, taken as truths, that claim to universally, unilaterally make sense of the world we live in. The social and cultural spatial coding of the body produces precarity as the body becomes marked by sets, by, by sets of norms of acceptable and safe behaviour. As Jung shows in Throwing Like a Girl, the female body is acculturated from an early age, practicing micro movements that are, that are accepted as female. Research has shown that these disciplinary norms absorbed by girls from an early age produce a more restricted neighborhood play area and later limit travel, travel after dark and in dangerous places, as well as constrain choice of modes of transport, um, such as walking and hitchhiking. Research in public transport has also found that the body takes on the tensions of the gendered space. But there's also this, a, a, alongside this, a desensitising in contrast to the, the male, what's called the male flaneur, the disconnected observer of city spaces, of city scenes. The female body needs some level of disengagement from urban space in order to navigate it. <coughs> Cultural meanings of childhood are also deeply attached to different spaces, so that movement between is considered to be transgressive. Much of this rests on a conceptualization of childhood as a generational phase to be protected. Over the last century, and in particular since the introduction of the, of the late 19th century Factory Act and Education Act that moved children out of the factories and into, the, into schools, childhood has been increasingly ca characterized as something to be safeguarded whilst at the same time recognising that there's still the other child outside the good, the valued and the respected. And this other child is often on the move, on the city street or crossing borders, 
Women and children are bound together in immobilities. We show this in the book, Children's Mobilities, that I wrote with Susana Cortez Morales, who is, uh, who, by the way, actually has just written a fantastic article um, she published with others, others in children's geographies on the violation of children's rights in Gaza. In our book, we argue that children's mobilities are interdependent, entangled with mobilities of others, and particularly their families and carers, who are most often their mothers or female social care staff. Children then adopt the cultures of mobilities of their mothers. My research on travel to school showed that mothers pass down understandings of public transport as being unsafe to their children. And this is a subject, has become the subject of some blame towards mothers. An influential book called Par Paranoid Parenting by Frank Friedi put forward the idea that, parent, that parental, and really we're talking about mothers, restrictions on their children's independence are predicated on maintaining their own sense of self. But a feminist reading focuses on the lifetime of gender violence that most women have experienced. And just to illustrate that point, the campaign group Our Streets Now, who we worked with them um, a little bit on our project on gender-based violence, um, have found that two out of three girls in the UK have experienced street harassment, just, which is just one aspect of gender-based violence. My own research on the um, with others on the immobilities of gender-based violence sets these experiences within spatial and mobility cultures which reproduce normalised forms <coughs> of masculinity. It showed that women experience violence because of, their, because of their gender across a range of connected spaces and throughout their lifetimes. The precarity associated with this then, then becomes part of their imagined mobilities. The significance of the imagined is key here. There is an enduring argument that women simply perceive certain spaces to be unsafe, whereas in reality, a reality based on crime statistics, there are actually, these spaces are actually, or public spaces are actually safer for women, um, and that's called the spatial fear paradox. It is, of course, important to acknowledge that the risks in city space, um, the, there are risks in city space um, that, that aren't, gendered which aren't experienced just by women so to young black men in particular however it's critical that we understand that the felt and imagined are integral to the lived and so the expectation of violence is violence in itself we understand this in terms of domestic violence in terms of threat coercive control and spatial control but less so in the connected forms of violence that are outside the home cultures of mobilities Practices and symbolic meanings of movement, forced movement of people, ideas, communications and things, thus need to be understood in ways that incorporate the imagination. Feminist methodologies are premised on the understanding that re research should be grounded in experience, and that's very central to my, my own research. My most recent article, which has just been accepted in the journal Mobilities, is an autoethnography, which is a method that came from feminist calls in the 1970s for, for autobiography to be recognised as an accepted research methodology. This method brings together ethnography, which is the study of a social or cultural group through close observation, and an autobiographical inward and reflexive study of the personal experience. I've carried out collaborative autoethnographies with Liz McDonnell um, and others on family mobilities and more recently on the immobilities of gender-based violence. This um, autobiography felt more personal in that it was looking at my own family. Um, I looked at my family across 100 years um, and it, although at the same time it was very much linked to the research I've carried out with Sue on intergenerational mobilities and um, some work I carried out with um, Helmi Yarvaloma from the University of Eastern Finland on, on looking at sensory engagements with city spaces across generations. So in this autoethnography, auto I sought to make sense of several spectacular stories of immobilities in my own family that were masculine and to show that stories of women's mobilities in my family were hidden, immobilised, they had to be carefully sought out. My autoethnography was mobile and generational tracing my family stories 
as I trace my own steps on journeys that I normally take, walking on the South Downs near my home and travelling to London to see my daughter. I purposefully examine my movements and the thoughts of movements of others, our imagined mobilities. This included interactions with mobile technologies, <clears throat> and in particular the Find My app, Apple's digital location tracking system. As an aside, there are grave concerns about the use of tracking devices used by adults for children or on their children. Um, there's accounts of parents hiding air tags in children's clothing and bags, as well as concerns about the use of tracking devices for stalking. This is something that I, will, I hope to look at more um, in future. In my own autoethnography, the use of Find My was mutually agreed. <clears throat> After an incident she experienced walking in London, my daughter shared her location and so I started sharing mine with her. Studies, including my own, have shown the ways in which people move with their children in interdependent and relational mobilities that in turn are part of the global connections. For example, using Find My app connects the multi-sensory micro-mobilities of switching on and looking at your phone and making sense of what's it, what it's telling you to either hundreds of millions of Bluetooth devices that work together to detect locations or to GPS satellites. But it can also highlight the mutual care around gendered immobilities. So an excerpt from my also ethnography about a journey I made with my, um, to visit my daughter in London. <clears throat> so today, after spending a few hours together, once finally united, we part ways on the opposite platform at, at London's King's Cross, and I walk to my train, imagine, imagining her journey back to her flat. I try not to look at find my phone, but as soon as I get to the seat on the packed train back to Brighton, I click it open and watch the dot as it moves across the rail along the railway line. I think about what she's wearing, about how dark it's getting, about her mobile confidence. I'm moving with her, chasing but not keeping up. I send the obligatory, text me when you get home. I look again at the dot on the map and inwardly sigh with relief she's nearly there. I read a few more pages from my book and hear the ping of her home now message, which is then followed by another saying, where are you now? Text me when you get home. I smile. As well as these interdependent mobilities that are linked to precarity, my paper also drew out and visibilised the mundanity of gendered immobilities, which contrasted with the spectacular stories that precipitated it. Again, looking at the ways that immobilities permeate from the micro-mobilities of the everyday to the macro-mobilities of state and beyond. I was familiar with the spectacular accounts of the male members of my family, <coughs> which, for example, includes three accounts of being held at gunpoint in Belfast, and a fatal road accident in Leeds in the 1930s at the time of huge growth in automobility and a moral pa panic around increasing deaths on the road. While seeking out the experiences of women in my family, I found my mum's diary from when she was 18. It's a tiny, soft-covered book with CSCA, the Civil Service Clerical Association, 1958, embossed in silver on a cover. There is not much space to dedicate to each day, but her handwriting is difficult to decipher, so I spent an, an entire day studying it, transported to Belfast in the 1950s. It's the, it's the diary of, of the mundane mobilities of a young woman with relatively few opportunities, living with her widowed mother in, on a, in a relatively low-income household. Nevertheless, she was mobile, traveling mostly by bus around Belfast, going out after work, going to the cinema and dances, regularly with her friends travelling outside Belfast to Dublin and to Donegal. Her mobilities appear relatively unconstrained, and I'm surprised by this, so I seek out other accounts, oral histories of Belfast in the 1950s, and find it was a period of relative calm, which is kind of hard to believe when you're living it in the 70s and 80s. But my mum got married, and she had to comply with the marriage bar. That was still in place in Ireland in the 1960s, it meant leaving her job, and instead of a daily commute, she then was mostly at home. Introduced to the UK after the First World War, the marriage bar forced women to resign from the civil service jobs when they got married. It was lifted in England, Scotland and Wales in the 1950s, but not until the 1970s in Ireland, reflecting the cultural immob immobilisations of the female body by the state and religious institutions in Ireland 
set within the context of colonialism that Nikki Khan and I discussed in our article on moving for abortion. <clears throat> My recent research shows the violence in these immobilizations. It opens out gender-based violence to include gendered lives that are not often thought of as violent. It focused on the immobilities of gender-based violence from the perspective of the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic and the associated lockdowns, space was reconfigured as people changed their spatial lives and patterns of movement. The impact was highly uneven. The restrictions on movement that were put in place during the pandemic resulted in escalating burdens for women. Caring, caring schooling, working, emotional labour <clears throat> and generation defining upheavals for children. Women had an increased risk of infection. <clears throat> they have higher reliance on public transport and are more likely to be essential frontline workers, <clears throat> making up 70% of the world's health and social, social care workforce according to the International Transport Forum. The impact, impacts of COVID-19 <clears throat> and lockdowns on children are, are also highly uneven. Children in the UK were away from school for up to six months in the first UK lockdown and experienced chaos around exam arrangements, as I'm sure a lot, a lot of you know. Leisure facilities were closed and they were unable to travel outside of their homes to meet family and friends. For children whose parents were living apart, this represented particular difficulties as they moved precariously between them. Research carried out with children showed their anxieties <clears throat> and the difficulties of life under lockdown, as well as some of the benefits that some children um, experienced. Patterns of gender-based violence <clears throat> changed in a way that revealed its spatial dimensions. There was a surge in domestic violence globally as more women were limited to their homes and the intensities of living in confined spaces with their, their abusers increased. This is described by a UN report in 2021 as a shadow pandemic. The National Domestic Abuse Helpline in the UK received 49% more calls than usual in the week ending 5th of April 2020. The pandemic produced new patterns of movement inside, outside and in online spaces. This meant that other forms of gender-based violence decreased as there were less people on the streets and on public transport. A survey for uh, by, um, by children's charity Plan International and the ca campaign group Our Streets Now found that 19% of young women and girls aged 14 to 21 in the UK experienced street harassment during the spring lockdown, but that rose to 51% during the summer as the restrictions were lifted. At the same time, there was widespread reports of increases in online harassment as more people were working remotely. The pandemic spotted, spotlighted these changes and our project set out to understand the continuum of mobile space across the UK in which gender-based violence occurs. Using the concept of immobilities to frame the inconsistencies of spatial change and movements to highlight the importance of the micro-mobilities of the home and the connections to broader scale movements. We define gender-based violence as inclusive of physical, emotional and sexual violence, rape, stalking and harassment as a pervasive global social challenge that is often immobilised in that both research and policy tend to locate it in unconnected static sites. Gender-based violence is understood and strategised within spatial and gender binaries. We already knew that gender-based violence takes place in a range of sites such as workplaces, universities, schools and colleges, surgeries, hospitals, shops, etc. as well as within an increasingly wide range of online spaces. We know that it occurs in mobile social space, in cars, um, on trains, buses and planes and on mobile media. But we wanted to begin to connect up these spaces and to understand more about cultures that underscore gender-based violence. This was a transdisciplinary project that brought together sociology, criminology and creative writing and in particular working, I was working with Jess Moriarty from, um, who's a creative writer in the school, our, our school at the University of Brighton. We investigated experiences through storying. We argued that a transdisciplinary approach that looks beyond disciplinary boundaries offered original insights into gender-based violence that could lead to social innovation in a range of policy forums like 
health, education, housing, transport. We use narrative methods to, um, we collated and analysed stories of gender-based violence that were um, available on the, in the public realm um, during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, we collected stories mostly from online. We looked at over 100 um, from a range of sources like campaign groups, newspapers, magazines. We had planned to, to collect new stories and devised a range, um, Jess in particular devised a fantastic range of arts-based workshops to generate these stories. And although people attended the workshops, um, there was, uh, we, we found a kind of surprising lack of engagement in terms of creating um, new stories. Um, and so we had to think about kind of alternative ways of storing gender-based violence. So this made us change track. Um, and we um, thought about other ways of collecting data. We decided that we would work towards creating stories ourselves within the research team. We decided on a collaborative autoethnography, ref reflecting on and sharing our own experiences of gender-based violence from the perspectives of, this, of the pandemic. We used creative writing methods to understand the cultures of mobilities that underpinned experience, creating a shared story of gender-based violence that spanned our lives. We even wrote this collaborative poem, which is a Japanese form of collaborative writing called Renga, which we interrogated further once we'd finished, combining our disciplinary knowledge in this transdisciplinary project. The research, including the narrative analysis of existing stories and our own autoethnography, found that experiences of gender-based violence are not only shared across multiple and connected spaces, but also across time, in that they begin in childhood and move through generations. We have um, just recently had a, a book chapter accepted um, that's in press on the impact of um, older women, who's, the, of the impact of gender-based violence on older women, whose stories we found were, were very much untold. We found that as well as in intensifying space, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns created opportunities for escape, for reflection across lifetimes. And often these two things were related. One story in particular stood out for us, um, and actually it stood out for um, the artist that we commissioned. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but it was it really resonated. This story of um, Grace from Age UK, um, who was 81 and endured 57 years of physical and sexual abuse, um, as well as financial and emotional coercive control by her husband, George. I'm just going to read um, a little bit of her story. When I was 20 two I met George he was handsome and charming he showered me with compliments and made me feel wonderful however he controlled every penny and decided what I wore and how I arranged my hair George would return from the races smelling of whiskey if he'd won at the races we'd dance and he'd treat me to a bottle of port if he if he'd lost he'd treat me to a beating when the children left home George allowed me to have a part-time job I started to gain confidence George noticed the change in me and began treating me differently. He even bought me a cat. I adored Misty and she followed me everywhere, but one evening, George whispered in my ear what he would do to Misty if I ever left him. He repeated that threat hundreds of times over the coming years. His memory has started to fail now. He gets frustrated and angry. Thankfully, problems with his hip mean he can't manage the stairs anymore, so he sleeps downstairs and allows me to sleep upstairs. Nighttime is my favourite part of the day. I can rest knowing he can't get to me and feel safe for the first time in years. I, li I lie in bed and my thoughts are completely my own. We found that this cumulative experience of gender-based violence leads to these varying intensities in emotional responses and sensory engagements that can be immobilising. Similar, similar to the desensitising seen elsewhere necessary for women to navigate urban space but also the amplified sensory and emotional responses precipitate turning points of resistance, acceptance and ambivalence. We understood more about the importance of stories as a form of evidence that could be used alongside statistics. They enable the felt and sensory and emotional experience of gender-based violence. Stories can bring gender-based violence to life in contrast to crime statistics and so they can be complementary evidence. Stories can transform cultures as part of policy dialogue. 
In addressing our aim of including stories from a range of sources, included voices that often go unheard, we commissioned comic artists from diverse backgrounds to illustrate stories we'd collected online, bringing their own interpretations of gender-based violence to the pan in the pandemic. This included young women from the street harassment campaign that I've talked about our streets now, women of colour and an artist, an artist who represented the experience of traveller women. The comic stories produced nuanced accounts and revealed hidden aspects of gender-based violence. They also represented visual accounts of gendered experience that are every day, stories that people don't want to hear, but that nevertheless need to be told and seen in order to denormalize and to, to restart the dialogue and continue the dialogue. We brought these ideas through to a second project, which was based on the re-representations of stories. <clears throat> the emphasis here was on the sensory, on the ways in which stories engage the senses. The aim of this project was to engage with our findings in inventive ways and with new audiences. One of the key aspects was that it became an international project and collaborative, working with experts in gender-based violence and mobilities in Mexico City. We worked with collaborators Paula Soto Villagran, an expert on gender-based violence on, on public transport in particular in, in Mexico City, and Olga Sabado Ramos, an expert in sensory studies. We adopted the methodology of trans-sensory storying. Based on the previous project, this method created layers, stories, layers of stories that brought different groups into dialogue and sensory responses to the foreground. We drew from the European Research Council project that was based in Finland, working with anthropologists and musicologists on transgenerational sensory transformations of space. We invited 10 visual and textual artists in the UK and 10 in Mexico to respond to first-hand accounts of gender-based violence. We used the accounts from our original project in the UK and then and they, they gathered together a series of first-hand accounts that were also in the public domain in Mexico. We briefed three sets of artists in three phases so that in phases two and three the groups of artists were responding to, vote to both the written accounts and then to the, the artists in phase one's artistic responses to them. So for example, an artist chose Grace's story that I've just read an excerpt from um, and interpreted it in photographs. And then another artist in the next phase would look at both the original story from Grace and the photographs and they would then reinterpret the story in their own way. The outcome is a sensorially rich collection of artworks that illustrates, um, that includes illustrations, zines, performance poetry, film, video, sculpture, and multimedia installation. We held public exhibitions of the work, um, which included roundtable discussions and panel discussions, both in Mexico City and in Brighton in October and November 2023. And as Stephen said, the exhibition is currently in Mithras House at the University of Brighton, and it's also at the National Autonomous University of Mexico at the moment. The collaboration with artists, the round tables and the panel discussions and the workshops have produced new insights that we are still bringing together. But the overriding theme is that creating dialogue on gender-based violence opens up shared discussions on gender roles and the ways in which they are placed. The transnational dialogues have brought together artists in the UK and Mexico through their art. We are currently writing a bilingual book which includes the artist's work and our own collaborative insights into the varied sensory stories. We are focusing too on the ways in which children are often absent in discussions of gender-based violence, yet they are often impacted through street harassment as that um, the camp campaign group Our Streets Now have demonstrated. I'm working on a paper with um, Susana Cortez on finding childhood in our exhibitions. The event in Mexico was punctuated by this moving and powerful piece, La Nina de las Rosas, by artist Maria Antoinette de la Rosa. It is based on a child femicide, a girl called Marisol in Morelos, south of Mexico City. It brought childhood to the forefront. Using the approach of child as method put forward by Erica Berman and intersecting the concepts of slow violence 
from Rob Nixon, um, who used it in relation to environmentalism and slow mobilities, we are purposefully tracing childhood across the exhibition. Again, we are finding the ways in which childhood and gender are bound together, bound up through the immobilities of violence, of urban precarity. The experiences of gender-based violence from childhood go through right from that early stage to older age. It tells a story that's not only relevant to the UK and Mexico, but across all urban spaces, from the everyday lives of, lives of women and children moving through city streets to the inside spaces of the home, school, online, etc. From the street harassment experienced by two thirds of young women in the UK to the unknown movements of the accompanied refugee children, for example, in, in Brighton hotels, from children living in Palestine in a context of extremes of violence that is, as Rosen et al. say, historic and embedded, stuck in place and indeterminate weighthood. To the forced movements of children across the US-Mexico border, we can make sense of all the linkages between these different micro and macro level, um, levels of immobilities, from the kitchen to the transnational. I'd like to finish off by coming back to policy and considering ways forward in addressing the precarity of women and children. How taking a cultural approach to mobilities can bring about transformations. It was in reading Paula Soto Villagren, my, um, our, our Mexica, Mexican collaborator. She worked on um, women only transport spaces in Mexico City. Um, and that actually that work, reading that work led to our, our, our recent collaboration. Mexico City has the second least safe metro amongst the largest cities of the world and the least safe in Latin America. More than 80% of users experience some form of gender-based violence. It is also the metro system with one of the highest flows of people in the world. Exper experiences of gender-based violence are common on underground and in metro systems. Lots of people are packed into very small spaces that are unsegregated and bodies are in very close contact. In response to violence on the metro, the Women's Institute of Mexico City implemented the Safe Journeys on Public Transport programme, which include women-only carriages on the metro, trolley bus, light rail, and women-only buses. Similar approaches have been adopted in Brazil, Japan, Indonesia, Egypt, India, Thailand, and Iran. And actually just a few um, weeks ago, there was a new women and children-only bus um, that began operating in Santiago in Chile. In the UK, women-only carriages were suggested as part of the Labour Party's kind of rethink on policy led by Jeremy Corbyn in 2015. And that brought um, a lot of renewed media and policy attention. British Rail had phased out the, um, the last of its ladies-only carriages introduced in the, 19, in the 1840s in 1977. There were also women-only carriages on the underground in London in, in the, that date back to the late 19th century. And they were introduced following a series of attacks on women travellers. A report on them at the time, which was part of the 2015 BBC coverage of, um, of the issue, quoted a British mother who said that compartments were very frequently occupied by nurses and children and that there was continuous baby talk. She continued, all ladies are not prepared to encounter the disagreements incident to the crying feeding of children not their own. 130 years later, a similarly intolerant Boris Johnson said in response to a 40% rise in children using London buses in 2008 that free travel for kids has brought a culture where adults are too often terrified of the swearing, staring your faceness of the younger generation. The policy was also blame, blamed for soaring youth crime, for uncontrollable yobs tearing, I quote, uncontrollable yobs terrorizing buses who were branded free travel bus louts. The common factor here is belonging and making place, either directly through creating dedicated space or indirectly through policies that give place, that counter cultures of precarity. The problem, research has found, is that policies that segregate or create new spaces can reinforce cultural norms that are then taken up by the body so that women and children only carriages, 
for example, reinforce women and children as victims, and free bus travel reinforces the notion of childhood as a threat. A study carried out on women-only carriages by researchers from Middlesex University, again, this took place in 2015 during that time of renewed interest, echoed most of much of the media response to women and children-only carriages. It found that they only reinforced the message that women must be contained and segregated in order to protect them. It went on that that segregation is therefore not recommended in countries such as Britain, where they would be a retrograde step outside of societies where the public realm is dominated by men in order to provide women with a secure means of public transport free from sexual interference. The inference was that the UK does not have this problem. But as other academics like, like Marion Tillos has found, these studies are often focused too narrowly. We need to open up the dialogue through a feminist lens to ensure that there is recognition of the problem as being prevalent through cities across the globe. This was make, made stark in the COVID-19 pandemic, during which mobility slowed to a level at which precarity was made much more visible, as ours and other studies have shown. It offered up a space for reflection. Perhaps we need to move to more proactive and experimental in policy appro approaches, including transport, but importantly across all the policy arenas in opening up spaces that continues to ask questions of our society in creative ways about whether dominance creates these spaces in a society which in many ways backs off from facing the prevalence of precarious mobilities. Measures to address precarity, to address gender-based violence, must be emancipatory, as Tillos suggests, and along the road to emancipation is critique and questioning. As Iris Marion Young suggests, there needs to be a commitment to place, and we need more research on this. Moving precariously in urban space is experienced by the majority of women and children, whether directly or through imagined mobilities. It is felt. Creating understanding of this precarity as a question of mobility cultures requires multiple lens. It is not possible to make urban space less precarious without thinking about how people move through space, how they make space in doing so, including reproducing patterns of injustice. It is also not possible to address issues of precarity without looking across disciplines and adopting methods of data collection, analysis and communication that are engaging. Making urban space that is not precarious might not be in thinking about a dedicated train carriage or a bus, but there needs to be much more transparency in the interface between lived experience and policy which is where mixing sociology with arts and humanities is key. We need research to open up dialogues on this issue that is so normalised in our society that policy doesn't always notice. Thank you. <laughs>